But Johnny, welcome to this special podcast in this series celebrating the magic of TV Centre. What were your earliest memories of the place? Um, I got, I was work, doing radios out of Manchester for BBC Manchester with people like uh, Les Dawson and Mike Yarwood and Freddie Davis and lots of other comedians. And I enjoyed it tremendously. <clears throat> and the producer <clears throat> got a message that BBC in London were interested in somebody for children's television. But because they came on to a, a fellow who handled comedians, they thought it had to be Cracker Jack. So he rang me and he said, I think this would be ideal for you. I said, well, Cracker Jack, so do I. So we got a, an interview. So I went to the interview in Manchester and I breezed in and I knew I'd got this job in three minutes. And he said, you're going to be wonderful in play school. I said, what's play school? He says, for under fives on, on BBC Two at 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, nobody had BBC Two. It was only about the second or third year of BBC Two. Nobody had it yet. And I said, oh, I'm off. I was off at the door. And he called me back and said, go on, have a go. So I actually did the audition. I did an audition, went down. They were all very nice. And there were actors going, <clears throat> Humpty and I, you know, um, Humpty and I, oh, you know, it was all, I thought, what am I doing? I was the only person in a suit because I worked cabaret then and clubs and I was doing very well. I was earning very well. So I had a, 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 a mohair suit made specially for me and everything. And ev all these actors were in jeans and pullovers and looked like they were out of work. I thought, what am I doing here? So I did the audition and I got laughs immediately from up, up, up in the gallery. And, uh, and it's always the case in this business. You always get the jobs you don't want. <laughs> and I got this job. So we started. And that was 1967. It was about January, February, March. And um, But as soon as I did it, I was suddenly introduced to Television Centre because they were in East Tower. <clears throat> Children's te television was in East Tower at Television Centre. So I, I found this wonderful place and they took me to the bar um, on the fourth floor where you all the stars would pop in. And it was just, it, you really were in show business. It really was show business. And I thought, oh, this is it. This is going to be fabulous. But <clears throat> I didn't do very well at play school because I, for one thing and another, I couldn't. I couldn't handle Hamble or Little Ted or anything. I hated it. It was just below me. Uh -huh. So so after I'd done a couple of weeks, they said, you're brilliant, except when we give you something you don't like, and then you're terrible. So you've either got to accept that this is part of it and join us, which we want you to, or, or, or pack it in. And I thought, why am I being bad at something? I don't know why I'm being bad at something, so I decided to be good. And they were, their integrity was so good. Now, in that time, I was working the clubs, and some of the clubs like Batley and Wakefield and, and Greaseburg were wonderful clubs, great places to work. But some in the Northeast and in South Wales could be terrible. It was really hard work in the clubs. <clears throat> so I thought, well, if I do this, at least I'll get off some of the bad clubs. It didn't work. I just got... I got lost some of the good ones as well. But that was it. And I was with the BBC and I, I was with Play School for 17 years. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it. But when I did my own programmes, they were made in Bristol. But our offices were in London and our offices were in East Tower for a while. Then we were out at North Acton, near the rehearsal rooms, where special effects were. And I used to I used to go into special effects and see things that other the Monty Pythons had used and I'd nick it for my programs because we didn't have the budget for the props. So I did all kinds of things. When I was writing a series for, for, for my think programs, I would go to the scene dock in London and the scene dock in Bristol and I say What's that? Oh, that's for a drama. It's just finished now. And it'd be a beautiful Dickensian window, you know, like the old curiosity shop. Or something like that. Oh, can I borrow that in three weeks time? Yeah. You can. So I get it for nothing. And that's the only way we could do our programs. We didn't have the budget. So we, I, I, I learned every skill. I was in television center one day and there's 
about four, perhaps five directors from play school and the other programs. And I said, where are you going? They said, we're going to a seminar. I said, oh, I'll come with you. And they said, it's for staff only. You're not staff, you're an actor. I said, oh, nobody knows. So I crept in and it was all about special effects. It was how to come through a slash curtain, how to walk through a door how to uh, shake hands with yourself and meet yourself, all double passes, triple passes, all those things. And they were all looking and watching. I was the only person in the room of over 100, perhaps get number 200 people. I was the only person in the room who used every special effect that I they showed me in the next year, 18 months put them in my programs because I was writing my program. So so that was what it was. I was just over a live wire with ideas, you know, but adults wouldn't let me in. The, the adults wouldn't let me in and I wrote sketches for the adults and they loved the sketches, but still didn't want me as a presenter. So I had to do it through through children's television, which was lovely. But I, I just loved Television Centre. It was fabulous. It's the greatest television, the greatest of its kind in the world then. Because there was nothing, there were big studios in in uh, Los Angeles, but there weren't complexes with eight pr studios and about four lesser studios and new studios and and things like that. They didn't have anything like that. It was the best in the world. So it was great times. Just like any landmark, TV Centre was blessed with architectural features which made it unique. The statue of Helios, the rounded corridors and the swinging double doors each contributed to its legend. How did these eccentric aspects contribute to its glory? Well, they almost destroyed it. Because <laughs> in the middle of the circle, they had a fountain. And the yes. fountain opened. And it, the wind always swirled around. You build a circle and let air in and it swirls around. So, and all the offices were on the, on the inside. So some, for some offices, it was always raining. It was all <laughs> raining on their glass. And for the others, because of the constant running, they were all going to the loo all day <laughs> because of the running water. So they had to switch the they had to switch the fountains off. So that bit didn't work. Everything else worked very well, but the fountains didn't work. So that, that was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Um, Coming to TV Centre following a successful career on the Northern Club circuit, how did it offer you a schooling in broadcasting, which you could then refine throughout the succeeding years? Were there any particular executives who helped you to cultivate your broadcasting style? I knew quite a few of the people in LE. I knew Barry Took, and I knew um, um, uh, oh Dick Bosborough and Barry Cryer, who were writers. I knew Spike Mullins, who who used to write for. He wrote all the Ronnie in the Chair, Spike Mullins, and he lived two miles from me, and I I uh, I heard his name. I was in a. It was a. It was a party at, at a pub, and I forgot what the party was for. But suddenly somebody said, and he was Spike Mullins. And I'd never seen him. Right? I said, you're Spike Mullins. I said, do you know the favourite joke for me? And I did this the other night. You know the favourite joke for, that you ever did, you wrote for Max Bygraves? He said, what? I said, where are you from, love? <laughs> Australia? I've got a sister in Australia due to a very unfortunate mix-up at Victoria Bus Station. <laughs> and I thought, I said, that was the funniest guy. He said, it's one of my favourites. How do you know? I said, I don't know. I just read, mm -hmm. I, I collected thousands and thousands of jokes. I sorted them into order so I could find all the doctor jokes, all the dentist jokes, anytime I wanted. And I used them in the clubs, but I didn't use them in television. So much. Well, I suppose I did. But I just knew people by their jokes. So when Dick Bosborough was writing for me, and he said, uh, you could say, I don't have to do this. I could be a, a reporter. I've always had a nose of something crooked. No, no. I could have been a reporter. I've <laughs> always had a nose for a scoop and a scoop for a nose. <laughs> and I said, yeah. Or he said, I don't have to do this. I could have been a de detective. I was always had a nose for something crooked and something crooked for a nose. <laughs> and I said to him, you wrote those for Bob Hope a couple of years ago. <laughs> and I knew. Mm. I don't know how I knew, but I knew. And I, I knew that. Uh, we, back, back to uh, Spike Mullins. 
He wrote all the Ronnie in the chairs. And he wrote them with a simple old joke. They were always a simple old joke. Every year. And he built on them. And it was wonderful. And Ronnie just loved the two of them worked so well together. It's a lovely story. Ronnie went, to, the, the two runs went to Australia, did a big tour, big tour. And when they came back, um, suddenly Spike got a check for a few thousand pounds. And he said, what's this? And it was a letter from Ronnie Corbett. He said, I used two of your sketches in Australia, so here's the money. He didn't have to tell him, didn't have to do it. Ronnie, Ronnie Corbett was a, a lovely, a wonderful gentleman. He really was. And, uh, and Spike wrote for him. Spike wrote for for, um, for Frankie Howard, and eventually Frankie Howard would have nobody else write for him. He was so nervy. Frank was ever so nervy, and, and it got worse during the end. He, his, his greatest thing, as I said the other night, was a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, where he played Lu Lucio, um, and... and um, that led to all the up Pompeys and all the other shows he did. It, it made his career, you know, and he loved loved him. And Spike also wrote for Marty Kane. You remember Marty Kane? Mm. Yeah, Marty Kane, a Yorkshire comedian. She was lovely. I saw her work many times in the club, and she was lovely. And she she got away, and he wrote for her. I'll tell you, a, a, this is a true story. They made they wrote did a program at Television Centre, and the director said, come on, we'll go to it for a meal in, in the West End. So he had one of those, I think it's CB5, one of those French tin cars. It, 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 it used to cock a leg as it went round corners, you know, one of those. And so it's, it's two seats and a little seat in the back or a little bit. So they got Spike in the back and they went in the car and they got to the West End. And they, they're in, I don't know where they were, but they, they're trying to get him out. And... And they can't get him out of the back. And he stood and they're pulling. Uh -huh. and they said, are you all right, Spike? He said, all right. He said, I feel like I'm playing the lead role in an abortion. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an outrageous oh. joke. <laughs> uh, it's very yeah. funny joke. I nearly yeah. did it the other night, but I thought, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, yeah, that was Spike. So... So I yeah so I so I knew everybody. So what happened then? Because I was doing children's programs in television, but people knew me from the clubs. There was a, a show called the Hot Shoe Show, which was for dancers, and it was a new idea. And they got them all together long before Strictly, and they got the dancers together, and they got the writers to write material, and it was terrible. And it was you see, dancers are all almost teenagers. They're very young. So the banter between them is partly sexual, partly flirty, partly, you know, a one-upmanship and all kinds of things like that. And I wrote jokes for them. And the series started. They caught me in the corridor and uh, said, have you got any jokes for this? And I I forgot. I don't, I generally have forgotten the jokes I did. I don't didn't recall them. But I gave them some jokes. And then every week they were asking for my jokes. Now, I got royalties from that show because it was sold around the world and nobody knew. And I don't think I had a credit on the show, but they they logged me in and I got royalties for the joke. So so I had this wonderful time. I knew all the people from um, Heidi High because we'd be in the next dressing re uh, rehearsal room for them and the next studio we were recording. So all kinds of things. So I just had a lovely time at Television Centre. And and absolutely loved it for a good few years. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry, Josh was lucky enough to know Barry Cryer. Oh yeah, oh Barry was wonderful. Yeah, what's my favourite joke of Barry Cryer's? How can a blind parachutist? How does a blind parachutist know when he's near in the ground? The lead on his guide dog goes slack. <laughs> <laughs> he he wrote a joke for me uh, when I was at, at Red Fusion, and it said, opening joke, hello, my name's Kim Philby. No, seriously, my name's Johnny Ball. And I said, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> 
<laughs> but had he written, I thought about it later, had he written, had he written me saying, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm only doing this show because Kim Philby missed his flight from Moscow. That would have worked because he escaped to Moscow. Uh, but Barry, I like Barry Mayweather. Barry didn't, had never seen me work well. He'd never seen me in the clubs. He knew my reputation, uh, but he didn't see me work well until I did some kind of charity thing at Reading. Uh, it, you know, and he was there and he watched me from the wings when I came off and he said, God, you're bloody funny. <laughs> and I said, it's taken you 30 years to realize that. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah. <laughs> One of the defining features of your BBC tenure was the iconic children's show Play School, which you presented for an unprecedented 12 years, predominantly from TC7. In 16. Opinion, 16 years. 16 stroke 17. I was the only presenter who ever resigned. Only one. People would, they say, we've had enough of them. But I was the only one, I said, I can't, I've got too much work on, I can't, please give somebody else a chance. And I, and I don't doubt. Anyway, carry on with the question. Just gonna say, so in your opinion, how did the show benefit from the, the vast landscape which TV Centre offered? Um, it, it, it had TC7, it dedicated, TC7 was dedicated to it. It held its own. All the crew, all the people who worked on it actually enjoyed working on it. Mm -hmm. It had an integrity that everybody understood. It had it had some kind of class. It had something that, that people, you know, always never really sent it up there are a few people tried to send it up i've tried to send it up quite a few times but but it, no it just had this wonderful wonderful feeling and cynthia felgate who was the executive producer she should have gone on to be head of children's because she was absolutely wonderful i do a rehearsal for one of my shows and when i finished the 25 minute show she'd go very good very good over there you were going over there, you said something, you stopped, said it, and then you moved on. Why did you stop, right? And I would go, and suddenly the whole program would go, whoa, and it was better. It was better from just that idea. Why don't you go from there to there? And uh, and probably, anyway, that's what she was good at. She was absolutely wonderful. Um, sadly, you know, she should have got head of children's, and she didn't. And um, Anna Hume took head of children's. Anna Hume came in. Anna Hume was very good in many ways, but she was drama. She loved drama. So she introduced Grange Hill, Biker Grove, and all those things. And I always thought those programs, uh, we weren't trying to be very clever and, and d for looking after kids. We weren't trying to do that. We were trying to give kids a look at the world, a look at the world that ha helped and benefited them. What those those plays did is they showed kids how to behave badly. They showed kids what it's like in a school, but the kids knew what it was like in a school. So they had to even go one better for the school, for the kids to watch it. And they made the kids naughtier and taught nobody anything. It taught them of the desperation of very young pregnancy, of bullying. It taught them that, but they, they were learning that anyway. And it even taught them that by showing them extremes of it. So I was never in favor of those programs. But when they came in, Roy Castle, uh, Tony Hart, myself, Johnny Morris, we had to fight for our budgets because of the, the amount she was spending on drama, which was much more expensive. And a lot of it went to the wall. So I left. I left and went to ITV for, for five years. But I was edging my way out anyway. And I started working for corporates. And I was doing films for corporates, you know, who were paying me £2,000 a day, which the BBC never paid me, you see. So suddenly um, mm. the, the corporates were fine. And I was winning awards with them. So in a way, as they were edging me out, oh, the other thing was I was 50. Zoe was 50 when she was aged out of children's television. Isn't it amazing? And, uh, and Zoe came in when they aged me out. Um, so I didn't like that. I, didn't, I really didn't like that. But 
but I moved on and it didn't didn't harm me in any way, but a few people were very upset by it. Um so but Cynthia she 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 should have been the boss she of children's she was absolutely brilliant you know sadly she died of breast cancer and uh, and we lost her very early regularly appearing on the bbc's flagship saturday morning children's show swap shop you would frequently take your daughter zoe how did the magic and glamour of tv center help to ignite her passion for broadcasting that's what did it that's what, how she got the idea and she loved it there was a lovely shot where i took her and my youngest son dan and Dan was about, you're only allowed in if you're about nine or ten. So he, he was actually underage. They didn't let you in if you're too young. And I think he was underage. And he was sitting on the back of about four rows of seats. And he fell off the back. <laughs> and, he, and it's in shot. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody was talking. And suddenly my yeah. son disappeared. <laughs> he fell off the back. And he didn't hurt himself. He sort of twisted him in there mm -hmm. and landed on his feet. But... Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's it. But Zoe's going, yeah, I'm going to do this one day, you know. And you can see, you can see it. She once said to me, she's in the car. And I said, what are you going to do for a career, Zoe? She said, do you know, an air hostess might be good. I said, oh, yes, a waitress on an aeroplane. And she went, oh, that's what it is, isn't it? And that was it. And that was the last time she said anything except for television. She just wanted to be in television. <laughs> As part of the BBC Children's Department, along with a host of stars, you frequently appeared on all-star Christmas record breakers. In what ways did the landscape of TV Centre help this show to work? Oh, well, we used the, the TC8 or TC1. TC1, which is the biggest. It's enormous. Um, TC1, I love lovely story about TC1. They once did a big Shakespeare. I think it was Julius Caesar, but it might not have been. But it was a big one, and all the names were in it. It was a colossal. Right. And they're all set for the main recording. And a fireman comes in and he gets his lighter out to see if this curtain's inflammable. You know, it's fireproof. And it wasn't. <laughs> and the whole lot went oh. up. And they had to pay all the actors again because they couldn't deliver it because the whole place studio was wrecked. Oh. And so they had to bring it back two weeks later and mount it all again. It cost a fortune. There was a lovely, another lovely thing. That, this is Christmas record breakers. They had six pianos, six grand pianos in a ring, and and a girl violinist in the middle, whose name escapes me. Um, six pe people who could play the piano who worked in children's television, right? And they were now. Maurice Plaquet was the man who hired them all the musical instruments, like all the pianos. So these were Steinway pianos, and they're worth a lot of money. So they take the lugs off and they put them in a sort of cover box, and they're all in the scene dock <laughs> at Television Center. And they started to, and the, some lads started to lift the first one. And he said, "No, I haven't got it. Hang on, hang on." It went boom, dong, 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 <laughs> dong, dong, and the six grand pianos were like dominoes, and they. <laughs> And that cost the insurance a fortune as well, because yeah. uh, they all had to repair, be repaired. So some very, very funny things happened. But but <clears throat> oh, I can't remember the producer of, of rec All Star Record Breakers was was Roy Castle's producer, of course, and Roy was the kingpin of it. But we used to do those, and we loved it. This was the only time where the children's unit got together, and we met all the others. Because you don't meet them. You're doing your shows, they're doing their shows. And suddenly we met, and, and it was wonderful. And we had other people who used to come in, but they didn't realise just how good we were at television. We did a lot of television, a lot of programme. So I remember um, Brian Kant and I singing, All I want is a proper cup of coffee, made in a proper cup of coffee pot. I may be off my dock, but I want a cup of coffee from a proper coffee pot, tin coffee pot. And coffee pots, they're no good to me. If I can't have a proper cup of coffee from a proper cup of coffee pots, I'll have a cup of tea. Don't. Right. Now, that's fine. I did that. That wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. But I did. we did that with another guy who was in Light Entertainment. I won't mention his name. And we rehearsed, and we were brilliant. And he couldn't crack it. He really couldn't crack it. Because he hadn't done the... He hadn't had the intensity of television work that we had. And uh, because we were in television in, in studios all the time, we were much happier 
into when I walk honestly last Tuesday night <clears throat> I was very nervous before the audience came in and that cut 15 minutes from the end uh, and had to find another end and Diet said you were white you were absolutely I said I know I thought I haven't got it right yet and the audience were coming in as soon as I went on stage I was not I was relaxed I had not a nerve in my body last Tuesday and that's because when I walked, when I did Strictly, I had not a nerve in my body. I just loved being in a television studio. And I just loved being on stage. It's what I trained for all those years. And I miss it so much. And so very quickly, I relax. And especially in a television studio. And I just love it. And it's it's home. It's more home than this, that I'm, my office that I'm sitting in. And, uh, and it's lovely. So that's because of the intensity, the number of programs we did. Okay. do you think that's why your generation had a bit more of an affinity with TV Centre? I think it was. I think it was. And I think, once again, it's Cynthia Felgate's driving. And, right, one thing they always said, never make a programme where the kids at home think they're looking in on somebody else's party. Never do that. So we didn't have kids in the show. You know, we talk straight to the camera all the time. We talk to the camera. Some Somebody once said to Cynthia Vega, you know, the, the sexiest program on television is play school. Because you've got a, a smart lad, a very attractive girl, and they're in a room somewhere with nobody else, just talking to the camera and getting on very well with each other. Yeah. So you start to wonder, what do what they get up to when the, when the cameras are rolling? And it's the <laughs> sexiest thing. To be honest, it was lovely. I, you, I got on so well with all the, my girl girl partners. Now, actors tend to go, that's about this in my line. Ha, ha, you see, and they were. But me, I just loved being with people and working with people. And so I was probably the nicest one to work with for the girls. So every new girl who did play school, did the first week with me, all of them. And I was very proud of that. I really was proud of that. And then, so Floella Benjamin, who's in the House of Laws now, still says, he taught me to stand up. Because I said, how do you stand up on television? Well, you, 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 you've you got to lean forward and go up as the, sorry, I'll do it, as the camera goes up. It's no good going like this. It's got to be that way. Hang on. Yeah, so so and I taught her how to do that, she remember, but lots of other things. And I was always generous and warm. I didn't need this is my bit, you know. And so and and I loved it. <clears throat> Same with all the musicals I did after television. I used to trust the actors so so much and give them bits. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> And sometimes give them stuff to do that they say, we can't handle this. <clears throat> bit of practice, bit of practice. And so a day later, wow, I can do it. <clears throat> and that was all the experience I had. Excuse me. <coughs> While you're drinking, I'll, I'll do the next question. After speaking with a whole host of different people who are integral to the magic of TV Centre, they've each commented that everyone was all together in one building, which encouraged creativity. As an entertainer with more than one string to your bow, what effect did this have on your career? It was as I said. It, it, it was as they said. <clears throat> so I'd, I would... <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Right. I would hang around um, other shows and talk to the performers and watch... <clears throat> I'm going to get some water. Can we pause this for a yeah. second? <clears throat> I'm okay now, Dyke. 
After speaking with a whole host of different people who are integral to the magic of TV Centre, they've each commented that everyone was all together in one building, which encouraged creativity. As an entertainer with more than one string to your bow, what effect did this have on your career? Exactly what they say. You, you mix with people. You could you could talk to people about ideas and things. Um, and uh, it's funny, I, I wrote three sort of uh, situation comedies, <clears throat> but one I sent to... Uh, to BBC Glasgow because it was for three girls called the Carlin uh, sisters. They were triplets, I, as any triplets, and they would say, "Oh, we're going to do this if their if their record takes off." And sadly, the Carlin's record didn't take off, so that ended. And then I wrote, and Thames were looking at the stuff I was doing, <clears throat> thing called Foundations of Fear, and another thing called No Holds Bars about Dockers, and none of them happened for political reasons. But I was, so I was not just at the television center, I was shooting off in all directions. I worked for Time T Television. I worked for Yorkshire Television for Don't Ask Me, where I wrote the jokes for four years and nobody knew. And what jokes? You're right, there's only about three jokes in the show. I, <clears throat> but I got paid and I did that for three years. So, so I was always dropping the position and nobody would allow me on, on screen. So it's it was children's television that allowed me on screen and I had to build it myself and build the show myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you worked everywhere and you must have been to all the TV headquarters, but what made TV Centre unique? It was it was the centre. It was the place, you know. When I got a flat, I went to Harris, somebody tipped me off go to the top when you're going for a flat. So I went to Harris and I said, I'm working with the BBC, <laughs> not for the BBC. I'm working with the BBC and I need a flat in London. And they gave me a, a lovely flat in Flood Street, which is absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> um, but I only had it for two months because as soon as I moved in, I went to South Africa and did a six week tour there. And then I was doing other things, um, a season in Blackpool and things like that. However, um, it was television that Stenzer there was gravitating to, and I knew it would would be, be very important. The thing was, though, when I started doing my think programs, they put those to Bristol. Now, is that was that good or bad? Frankly, it was much better. If I can say this indelicately, <clears throat> the crew in Bristol did everything for us in. Television Centre, a lot of crews were brilliant, but you could get an odd crew that were very lazy. And some programmes allowed you to be lazy by not moving anything at all in the show. So the show was set up, you know, just people at desks, people talking, and nothing else to do. So the crew was just sitting there. Uh, yeah. And they got very lazy about that. So when we had this all moving show, like the Think Again and the Think of Numbers, <clears throat> they couldn't cope with it. And so, but so we found Bristol were brilliant. Bristol's crew, but that was one crew for one studio, and they were so dedicated, and um, and they won a lot of awards for for, for the, the work they did, uh, because they were so so brilliant. You know, I told stories last Tuesday about the insurance when we did a program on jewelry, and uh, the insurance was the biggest the BBC ever had for one day, uh, for insurance, and when we were filming it. Thieves broke in and not picked, nicked all the computers out of the offices because uh, <clears throat> all the security was around the studio. And uh, but they were they were fabulous. They did all kinds of things. We couldn't get a Lamborghini in the studio one day, and in Bristol. And so they said, "Can you do it after lunch, John?" I said, "Yeah." And the director and I, "Yeah, we'll do it." And they and round the studio doors, there's three quarter inch steel, and it's a dorm about that wide. Right, they cut notches in it with oxyacetylene cutters that will be there forever. 
in the sea knock door so you could never have a perfect seal again just to get the Lamborghini in. And they would do all kinds of things for us. They were, they were quite incredible. Um, when we did fire, they had to switch off all the alarms, all the sprinklers, everything, <clears throat> and hope we didn't catch fire or hope it was always controllable. Um, so, yeah, so Bristol were marvellous for us. But our offices were still um, a, a around television centre, you know. One of the defining shows that came out of TV Centre during this period was the Morecambe and Wise show. And honing such a willing, winning formula took the genius of a handful of people. However, you knew the writer Eddie Braben from the Northern Club circuit. How do you think being in TV Centre offered him creativity in which to find the true essence of Morecambe and Wise? Eddie worked for, for, for Ken Dodd for 15 years or more. Eddie invented the Diddy Men. Eddie invented virtually all the stuff that Doddy did about Dilly Men, about snuff quarries, about uh, Jambulty Mines and all those. It was all Eddie. And eventually they fell out. Now, they fell out actually at a party at the BBC at Television Centre. And because Eddie found out that there was something not wrong, not quite right with the financial deal he was getting. And he realised it had been going on for some years. So he stormed out and drove back to uh, Liverpool and he never worked with Kendall again. But somebody who saw him walk out and realised what had upset him was Bill Cotton. And Bill Cotton was the head of Light Entertainment. And Bill Cotton picked the phone up and rang Eric and said, I think we've got a writer for you. And that's how it happened. And suddenly Eddie was writing for Morecambe and Wise. And Morecambe and Wise had been very popular but their television success hadn't been that good. Somebody once mentioned, what's the television? It's the box they bought, buried Morecambe and Wise in. That was in their early career, you know, so they hadn't done particularly well, but people loved them. And when they were working, you saw them work. They were, they were so lovable and wonderful. <clears throat> but it hadn't worked until Eddie Braben came along. And Eddie Braben wrote all those Christmas shows. Other people came in and wrote individual sketches, like Barry Cry and all the others. But Eddie was in control of it all. Eddie had the jokes like, beamer, beamer, beamer. he'll never sell ice cream going at that speed. And all those, they were all Eddie's gags. <clears throat> mm. and, uh, and Eddie Braven, how did he work? <clears throat> he was in his front bedroom in his house in Liverpool. And he had a collection of books. Beano Dandy, Beano Dandy, Beano Dandy. The annuals of Beano and Dandy for years and years back. And he would sit at his typewriter and go, what, what am I going to do for this year's Christmas show? And he get the job, he get a, an idea from a Beano or Dandy Annual and work on that. And that's how he produced it all. You just have to get your mind down to the simplest, silliest idea and build on that. And it's very difficult to get to think simply, <laughs> you know, like an idiot, like, you know, how can you, you know, <clears throat> so, and, and that's what Brett Eddie did. And he was a wonderful writer. And, uh, and, and uh, he knew me, he'd seen me in the clubs and, and we, we, we knew each other very well. And um, uh, he was, he was a wonderful writer. Absolutely wonderful. Speaking of Morecambe and Wise, you auditioned for John Ammons for the Val Dunican show when you were a comedian. What sort of man was he? John was the, the quietest man. He lived in Gerrard's Cross, uh, just up the road from me, literally three, three, three or four miles away from me. And he was a lovely man, a very quiet man. And um, he, 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 he's absolutely super. And he was a very, he was, he would, he was quiet, but he was always thinking. And he, he, he smiled at jokes. He didn't particularly laugh all that well, but he smiled at them all. But he had a wonderful control. And a wonderful understanding of control. So when I went to see him the first time um, for, for an audition, <clears throat> the which floor was it? The seventh floor, sixth. No, it's the sixth. The sixth floor, I think. The comedy was on, and I went up there, and it was all very busy. And I said, oh, "Well, get, we're here, nothing. We, we, you know, come on." So he walked me down a corridor and into a room, and this room was full of desks. It was a storeroom for desks. So there was just enough room for us to sit opposite each other, this far apart, right? Sitting on the edge of a desk. And he said, what would you do if, if 
you had the Valdrina Good Show. I said, well, I was coming here today and I put my arm out to stop a bus and I wasn't strong enough, it wrenched my shoulder. But it stopped anyway when the back of got level with me. I said, how far, how much is it to Shepherd's Bush? He said, from here? I said, yeah, he said, seven months. This is before metric, right? Seven months. I said, oh, well, I don't carry a lot of money about with me, you see, especially in a strange town. So I said, do you mind if I run behind for a few stops? He said, please yourself. So I'm running behind. I thought, I'm saving tuppence here. And I thought, I'm a fool. Run me out a taxi. I just saved a couple of bob. <laughs> so I caught him up with some traffic lights. I said, how much is it now? He said, it's one on three. We're going the other way. And that's all I did. And he yeah. said, I'll fit you in. I'll fit you in. And that was my audition. I'll yeah. fit you in. When he gave me the show, I thought, I'm not doing that. It's it's funny, but it's not good enough for a first telly. So I didn't do it. I never did that on television. So, so, so there you are. That's uh, the premiere. Where I got it from, when I wrote it, I don't remember. I don't remember. I had so many bits and pieces that I did. So many sketches. You know, I, I, I once hired a, was I in a car? He said, <clears throat> he said, I'm afraid it's 20p a mile. I said, oh, God. He said, well, yeah, that's the way it is. So I said, all right. So I hide it and I reversed everywhere. I'm going around this roundabout backwards and this fleeman said, didn't you see the Indians? I said, it didn't even see the errors, which is the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I said, it was all right reversing everywhere. The only trouble was every now and again, the fuel tank would overflow. <laughs> so, and that's the kind of jokes I was doing, and I was doing in clubs. And I could really take the, you know, all yeah. kinds of things I did. And, um, and jokes like, I was offered a job in Oak Calcutta. You see, my agent said, they want you in Oak Calcutta. I said, I said, we'll send him a picture. He said, no, you send him a picture. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's, it's, it's full frontal nudity. <laughs> so get some pictures taken. So, so, so I went down to the bus station. <laughs> well, I'm not going to a photographer. They've, they've all got names like Jerome. <laughs> so I'm not going there. So I went to the bus station, right, in the, the photo mm. booth. Wound the seat up. <laughs> mm. Stood on the seat. Four quick flashes. <laughs> we came out. A bit underdeveloped, I thought. <laughs> Sent them away. They offered me a small part. <laughs> I said, I'm not having that. I'm not, it's a lot of hanging about. And that was a, a routine I did for the clubs about, about Oak Alcutta. And mm. uh, so there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in order to develop such a creative hotbed of talent, which TV Centre thrived upon, there were a whole generation of pioneering management who had the vision to create such a defining era of TV. How integral were people like Bill Cotton, Hugh Carlton Green, David Attenborough and co to the development and presentation of the values which TV Centre stood for? Oh, as you say that, I'm trying to remember the boss of children's when I joined, and I've forgotten his name. And I've forgotten his name. And his he was a lovely, lovely man. He was ex RAF. He was a lovely man. He used to he used to walk around with his hands in his jacket pocket with the thumb out, um, his tree jacket, and he would talk to you. And he was the head head of BBC. But he would come be down at in the children's. Um, studios all the time and he was just a lovely lovely man and they all were and bill cotton was so approachable and you know they were they were absolutely great um later on it wasn't always like that but it but it was michael gray was wonderful as well you know they, they were great listeners um but there were always tugs and from children's the problem was people were tugging for budgets and children's budgets we kept low and low. It's as though we didn't have the bite. We didn't have the elbow room, the, you know, and it was always tight. <clears throat> so when our head of finance for children's left, um, he, he was well known, George Azeros, he said, I'm sad to be leaving, but in a way, I think it's the best thing because I think the blue or purple period for children's television, which has been the best television, children's television series, C, uh, section, group in the world. I don't think it's going to last much longer. And I think I'm better out of it now. And it was so sad. And I even then thought, I don't even think the people at the top floor 
or even listening. And what happened next was Children's was taken away from uh, BBC One and given their own channels. And they've never done the bit figures that we did, you know. We did five and six. Play School turned on cold at 11 o'clock in the morning to three million viewers, then four million viewers. And in, even in the afternoon, we play school start again at four o'clock and we'd turn on to a huge figure. And we were doing five, five billion, you know, before, before the news came on and then the younger people's programs and then older. And it was a, a sequence that took the whole viewing family through from four o'clock when the kids were coming home from school right through and it was seamless and that made it so good children bbc children's was so good that itv stopped buying cartoons from america because the figures didn't justify what they were paying for them that's the only reason they loved them and, and, and the kids loved them but they didn't get the figures because we were getting all the figures and so we we really were in control and i'm afraid they threw the baby out with the bath, bath water with that so it's very sad so I was in the era which would be classed as, as, as the purple patch, the golden era of children's television. But I think that's the case for most of the stuff in, in, um, in Television Centre. For Heidi High and um, Dad's Army and Ain't Our Fuck Mom and all those programmes, you know, they were all wonderful. They were all wonderful. And there were whole loads of them. And then you, Tomorrow's World and things like that. Tomorrow's World was wonderful. But at the end, it wasn't. At the end, it was all... It, they'd lost the art of, of making a seamless programme. And suddenly you had one item that was very clever, one item that was totally trivial, one item that was so complex that the viewer got lost in it. And, 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 and it became a a ragged magazine program and i told them that and i they asked me three times i was asked if i would join tomorrow's world and three times i said can i write my own bits and they said no you'll have a writer i said i've just written 20 series of programs ah but you're a good presenter i said well could it be i'm a good presenter because i've had good scripts and that's what i what what made me the the, the material i gave myself you know and uh, yeah, they. I'm afraid they lost the plot, and um, they, they were dropped. First of all, Torrance World was put opposite Coronation Street, right, and then it was dropped altogether uh, by Alan Yentob. He got fed up with it, and 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 they were all. It was, they was, so it's so tr such a tragedy mm -hmm. that such a wonderful series as Torrance World suddenly lost the plot. You know, so there we are. It's we, so, but nothing lasts forever, you see, and it changes. And now, I don't understand television now. I just don't understand it. Um, I, I've pitted ideas time and time again. And, and new agents say, go on, I'll put your ideas in. Nothing comes back. Yeah. But, but, and I don't mind. You know, at 84, I'm not really dying for another series. Um, but I take it tomorrow, the offer one, you know. But um, no, it moves on. It's, it's different. It's a different ball game, And that's how it works. As a broadcaster, in what ways did TV Centre make it easier for you to shine? It, it was just it was just the the departmental bosses were always brilliant at bringing new talent on, and and seeing that you had something special to offer. What I had special to offer was humour, and a very few people had had the humour. So sometimes in play school they say just sit down and instead of a story today, just talk to kids about laughing. And I say, hello. Um, I'm going to talk about laughing today. <laughs> do you laugh a lot? <laughs> do you? How do you laugh? Do you laugh like this? <laughs> or do you laugh like this? <laughs> or do you... So I do three or four minutes on how to laugh, uh, which wasn't even scripted. Um, and that's because because I, I sort of knew, knew it. But I'd never talked about laughing in comedy. Ken Dodd did. Ken Dodd said, well, you have a chuckle muscle. Down here, you see, and, and, and he talked about about uh, laughing. Um, so it, it was just it was full of invention. So we had a, a guy called Peter Wilshire, and he said, "Right, this week I haven't really written any scripts, um, but I've got these balloons. So come on, let's fill up. What can we do with balloons?" And so for a week, we bobs balloons about, and it turned out to be five very good programs. <laughs> 
Another guy came in and he said, uh, um, I want I want to do something about dance and the arts. So I've got two trainee ballet dancers, boy and a girl, from um, Sadler's Wells or something. And I've got Anthony Van Last. And Anthony Van Last is, of course, a choreographer who choreograph choreographed the film Mamma Mia. And he's a brilliant, brilliant chore choreographer. But he was starting out then. And we actually, with Anthony and myself, we actually produced five uh, play school programs, literally from scratch. What can we do that can take the audience, the kids with us, under fives? And what could we do? And could we do a bit more tomorrow? And could we do a bit more? And is it all about balance? Is it all about being fleet-footed? Is it all about poise? And uh, we did all that. And it was just wonderful. So the experimentation was always there. And, uh, and But that was just in play school. And I think it was the same in many, many programs. On Friday the 22nd of March 2013, BBC TV Centre closed its doors for the final time. What was your reaction to this? Horror. Horror, sadness, um, disappointment. I mean, the fact that the television centre is so, is so good that ITV have got two, uh, the old Studio 8 and, and Studio, no, Studios 1 and 2 and 3, I think now, and are still using them and doing all their morning programmes um, shows what a facility it was. I can't, I can't understand it. They, they once, I think what the BBC had done, if I can say this, uh, I don't know, the, the, the senior executives might not agree with what I'm saying. They did an audit 20, 30 years ago and found that the BBC owned 50 major buildings in the city of London. So some of them they sold out. Um, so the Acton Triangle, big triangle now, has got skyscrapers on it, but that was special effects. It was uh, the rehearsal rooms, the Acton Hilton and all that. And the BBC, I've always been aware, cleverly and rightly so, that they must invest some of their money so that if there ever is a problem, they have it to fall back on. So they're, they're very wise and they're very right to have collateral behind them. So when they sold Television Center, I'm sure they actually acquired other buildings and other real estate that keeps them solvent. So if it should happen that the license uh, fee system is ever dropped, I think the BBC would take a long time to go under because I think it would tap into the resources it had until it corrected and leveled the ship and leveled the whole thing. You see, the BBC really is arguably the greatest television service in the world still today. It's not co corrupted by commercials. It's not bent this way or that way by commercials. It, we've got, you know, we, we, we've got... There's a great deal of respect for the BBC throughout the world. And, uh, and we've got to honour that and, and realise that the BBC is just a wonderful, wonderful institution. Um, and when I was a kid, all everybody on BBC television wore dress suits. <laughs> <laughs> and I never had a dress suit, or my dad did. So yeah. the fact that I would one day have a television career Never entered my head. Never, ever, 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 ever until it happened. Um, because it was just out of my reach. But that's the other great thing about uh, the BBC. It's not out of your reach. And talent comes through. Every generation produces new talent. And it's just this wonderful perpetual growth of talent that it produces. And it, we must never lose the BBC. As David Attenborough said, it belongs to all of us. Every one of us. Wow. Well, <laughs> Well, what about you? Right. 
So Josh was saying, um, obviously a lot of it's now gone to Salford and the news has gone to Broadcasting House. But what about people like you? Where would where would you have gone now? Now that it doesn't exist? Um, uh, yeah. Well, well, well. Once again, I, I think the wrong thing happened. We, 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 we're, we're talking about the television centre, it's fine. But remember, all my programmes are made in Bristol. Uh, uh, Birmingham made lovely magazine programmes. Lots of light entertainment came out of Manchester, and so the regions always played their part. So the BBC was always greater than television centre. Television centre was the hub, um, but in actual fact, most people. Oh, we've lost your video. There we go. I think so. I think we ran out of time. But yeah, the BBC is bigger than television centre, so the BBC isn't reduced now that television centre's gone, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Been great to talk to you, Josh. Really has. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Man. Josh will Josh will let you know when he's put it all together and he'll send it on to you. Knockout. Knockout. Thank Come you on. very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.